On this Indiana expedition, we'll follow dinosaur fossils from South Dakota all the way to the paleo prep lab of the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. We'll go on the smallest field trip ever to search for micro fossils. We'll explore the depths of an Indiana cave and we'll get our hands dirty at an Indiana coal mine, all in the name of Earth Science. Try it yourself. Let's go check it out. Come on. Indiana Expeditions with Rick Crossland is made possible through the generous support of the Dr. Laura Hare Charitable Trust, enhancing Indiana's natural environment through preservation and protection of ecologically significant natural areas and promoting environmental education, stewardship, and awareness. CEPI, the Science Education Foundation of Indiana, investing in Indiana's youth by encouraging them to become scientists and engineers and to practice their careers in Indiana. Details at sefi.org. And the Center for School Improvement and Performance, Indiana Department of Education. Today, we're gonna to take a closer look at the ground beneath our feet. I'm in South Dakota, a great place for earth science discovery. Behind me are a group of Indiana scientists and teachers digging up fossils that give us clues to what ancient life was like 65 million years ago. I bet you're not used to seeing teachers do something like this. Definitely takes you beyond your comfort range. This is what kids expect all dinosaur bones to look like. You don't understand how exciting it is to find a bone until you hit your first clink, you know, and you hear the bone. The excitement will build in the kids, and who knows, maybe I'll inspire one of them to be a paleontologist one day. This is science. Try it yourself. years ago, the South Dakota we know of today was a densely vegetated coastal wetland. This dig site was once home to the Edmontosaurus, a huge plant-eating duck-billed dinosaur that traveled in herds of thousands. Now it's a deathbed. Edmontosaurus is a duck-billed dinosaur, a herding dinosaur. Uh, he looks like a big duck. His head looks like a duck. Basically, it's the, the largest duck-billed dinosaur there is. But they're huge, they're T-Rex sized, and they traveled in huge numbers. If you think about a thousand of them walking through this valley in a migration, they would have eaten everything in sight, they would have been very noticeable, and of course, some would have died. This one layer of bone had over 10,000 individuals. And there are 300 plus bones per animal. That's tens and tens of thousands of bone here. This is what's known as a secondary deposit. These dinosaur bones were brought here from another place. And we know it's by like a river sediment because we get, well, the sand still in there. We get the little river animals. We'll get crocodile, we'll get turtle, we'll even get little uh, freshwater gastropods. What killed them we don't know yet. Did they die year after year at this spot? Or do we have a mass killing at one section and then the bones washed here later? So we've got a lot of questions to answer. One thing about bones tumbling down a stream is that they don't stay together. But for a paleontologist, this just means more time to play in the dirt. That kind of makes it fun. If you're putting a skeleton together, you got to do a lot of work. If you dig the left humerus, you keep digging until you find that right humerus the exact same size. So we have nine or ten of those bones at work, and none of them match. So you have to dig a lot of bones to do the 320 bones of one duckbill dinosaur. This is what a full skeleton of an Edmontosaurus looks like. These are the bones we're after. Right now we've got, oh, I don't know, 30 or 40 bones already uncovered over the last couple days that they're steadily, uh, right now, just gluing and uh, uh, we're foiling them and getting them out of the ground. We figure in the next few days we'll probably have about 100 or 150 bones ready to bring back to Indianapolis. It sounds like they found a lot of bones, but there are thousands yet to be discovered, and there's only one way to do it. You gotta get out, walk around. Sometimes you can't even walk. You have to get on your hands and knees and crawl and look for broken bits of bone. You, you 
find the broken fragments and you try to find where they eroded from. You look up on the hillside, you kind of scramble up the hills looking, and you'll see a, a bone fragment just sticking out the side of a hill, and that's where you know to dig. But every single one of them is found by, by people doing footwork and just getting a sunburnt neck, basically, looking down on the ground and seeing what they can find. Cretaceous gumbo, all that's missing is the top of the food chain, T-Rex. A 110 degree heat, blowing winds, all forgotten as we uncovered one duckbill fossil after another. Then I made an interesting discovery. At first I thought it was a nanotooth. I'm hoping it's a nanotooth. Often left behind by the nanotyrannosaurus, a smaller relative of the T-Rex. It's a pretty interesting curving bone. Further observation revealed that it was actually a claw, a first for this site. Holy smokes, that's pretty cool. <laughs> first claw found. We don't know what, theropod, meat eater. We found their teeth, we found their bones. Looks like we found their claws. More poison. Victor I mean, explained the importance of this find. All those are to find a claw tells you that the dinosaur died here. Uh, the teeth are just a sign that the dinosaur fed here, but the actual claw meant that that dinosaur actually perished. So not only, uh, you know, so all of a sudden you're saying, oh wow, another element here. The dinosaur died with the duckbill. So all of a sudden you have two dinosaurs that died. The scavenger and the scavenged. Finding something new is the spirit that drives us. That's why we do what we do. The world is an open book of possibilities and it's available to anyone. So keep your eyes open, you never know what you might find. That's the tail of a baby. Yeah, it's the tail of a baby. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Really? I don't know if it's the tail of a baby. <laughs> that's, it could be the tail of an adult, it's just the very end of the tail. Okay, it's the tail of a dwarf <laughs> adult. <laughs> I don't know. That's the end of the tail. End of the tail. That's the end of the tail. You don't have to come all the way to South Dakota to find fossils. In fact, back home in Indiana, you can find fossils that are even older than dinosaurs. At one time, there were dinosaurs in Indiana, but their remains were scraped away by huge moving sheets of ice called glaciers. Now the only dinosaur bones you'll find are here in the Dinosphere at the Children's Museum of Indianapolis. However, glaciers did grant us access to the layers below that contain fossils of the earliest life on Earth. To learn more, we visited with Dallas Evans, who had some interesting fossils to show us. So Dallas, we're here back at the museum, and we've just spent a long time on dinosaurs. There's no dinosaurs here, but Indiana has some pretty special fossils. Do you agree? We have some pretty spectacular things in the state, yep. What do you have here to show us today? Well, when we dig dinosaurs, what we dig are things that are 65 million years old. In Indiana, we have a lot of things that are 300 million years old plus. So all these are Paleozoic fossils, far older than the dinosaurs that we dig. All from Indiana, lovely things like this Isotelus trilobite. This comes from Madison, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And also from Madison, Indiana, is this little Flexi Calamity trilobite. This gorgeous little Paleozoic creatures. We also have brachiopods, that are basically shell fossils from Indiana. Gastropods or snail fossils. This looks just like a snail in our backyard. So these are very similar then, I guess. But very similar. Um, you could pick one up and it's hardly distinguished from one in your backyard. These, however, are marine specimens, so they're, they're ocean animals. 300 million years ago, Indiana was at the bottom of a shallow ocean. It was this ocean and its sea life that created the limestone deposits that Indiana is known for today. And within this limestone is a fossil that Indiana is famous for around the world. If you're in Indiana, this is what you want to look for. They're uh -huh. beautiful specimens. They're called crinoids. Um, they used to be called sea lilies, but that's a bit of a misnomer. They're not really plants. They kind of look like plants. Mm -hmm. But it's actually, well, essentially a starfish with a stalk. It's an echinoderm. And it's a filter feeder. This little, this little head would kind of open up and filter feed. So this guy is kind of on a stalk, and, is, and it, it, the head of it, or the calyx, is, that mm -hmm. it, is a filter feeder. So most people would see this, they would think, oh, that's a plant or something. But actually, it's an echinoderm, which is an animal, because it has the ability to move. Now, um, 
most of the time when I've been out with kids, we find pieces of these that look like little bitty Cheerios and okay. such. Mm -hmm. And so what part is that on this? That's actually a stem section. Uh -huh. These are actually very, I don't know another word for it except for breakable animal. Once they died, the skeleton was very fragile. So wave apart. action or another animal going nearby mm -hmm. would just break them apart, shatter them, and you get all these little columns, these little bits of the stem would break apart and you find little sections that, well, look like Cheerios. Museums the world over come to Indiana to try and find these crinoids. Um, we have some of the best known deposits in the world. In fact, I think the state fossil is a crinoid. Perfect, uh, yep. It's uh, Cyanthrocrinites multibrachiatus. You get an A plus for the day, that's, that's perfect. One. And these brachiopods right next to it are beautiful. But I have to ask you, this is a strange looking thing. And is that a dinosaur? Is that a, a marine fossil? I actually love this piece. It comes from Shelbyville. And when people bring it in or when people see it, they automatically assume it's a dinosaur. But mm -hmm. actually, it's much later. It's, um, it's from a large mammal. It's from a mammoth. A it's mammoth. It's a mammoth tooth. Oh, a singer, wow. single molar from a mammoth. And that's from Indiana? From Indiana. But that is, these are very old, and dinosaurs are very old, but this is relatively new. Actually, pretty young. It's Pleistocene. That's an era that's 2 million to about 15,000 years ago. So this is at the very end of the Pleistocene. So it's in thousands of years instead of millions like we're used to. So not all Indiana fossils are sea animals. Indiana was inhabited with giant land animals only a few thousand years ago. These fossils are rare and can be hard to find, but you can find your own Indiana fossils wherever you see layers of limestone. This is science! Science is science! I recently scooped up some rocks near the road and brought them to my science camp. You'd be surprised what you can find in a pile of rocks. I invited a group of second graders from St. Monica School to join me on the world's smallest field trip. You could spend a week studying and finding all the different things that are on this piece of limestone. There's crinoid stems. Look at this. Oh, ah, cool. Ah, look at this. You can find many different types of Indiana fossils, crinoids, trilobites. That is the head of a trilobite gastropods, and even brachiopods. Here, this is like a fossil zoo. But it's what we don't see that can be the most important find we ever make. Microfossils. You know, microfossils are everywhere in Indiana, under your feet, under your fingernails. But when you find some cool microfossils, we stop here at the Children's Museum to talk to William Ripley. He is our expert on things that are small. Hey, William, how you doing? I'm good, how are you? We're here with these really small fossils at mm -hmm. the museum. This one right here just has to be just a flake of a bone. What, what in the world is that? What we have right here, this is actually a part of a fish jaw. A jaw? A jaw, yep. That's only, that's not even a centimeter large. No, it's not, and if you look really closely, you might even be able to see the teeth in it. Oh yeah, I, I guess a microscope helps with microfossils. Hence microfossil. <laughs> now a microfossil, what is a microfossil used for? Uh, there's a few different things uh, they can be used for. Uh, index fossils, uh, that lets us kind of show how the world has expanded. Plate so tectonics. if you go to the library, you go to index file, and you know that these numbers books go here. So is a fossil like that, an index fossil? Pretty much, yes, yeah. Okay, so if you find a small little fossil and you know that that was in this layer of rock and you find that same fossil somewhere else in the world, what does that tell us? It gives us a basic age so that we know that everything you find in that layer is the same age as everything you find in a layer farther away. Okay, so uh, microfossils are important for that. What, are, what other uses are they? Um, they can help fill out the environment. They, they let us know what other types of animals were around. We know we have the big animals. Mm -hmm. These tell us the smaller animals. Well, can you tell climate or uh, how would you tell climate about them? Um, by what types of animals you find. For example, that is a crocodile scoot. Uh -huh. Crocodiles are found only in certain climates, mm -hmm. so we can gauge what type of climate there was where this was found. So this is almost kind of like a list of the, all of the animals in exactly. the ecosystem. Exactly, you're right. Now, these seem like they would just blow away, so how do you find something like this? We take the rock and the dirt that mm -hmm. come in with the fossils, and I soak it down. I usually soak it for about a week in water. Mm -hmm. I run it through screens, basically like a screen you'd find in your screen door. Mm -hmm and that washes all the dirt away. 
And what's left are these little pieces. And then I let them sit for a few days, dry out. Mm -hmm. I collect it, that's what's called concentrate. I've concentrated everything down. Mm -hmm. And then I uh, put it under a microscope. You can have an entire museum in a shoebox, basically. Well, that's great. I tell you, big fossils, medium-sized fossils, micro fossils. William Ripley, thanks a lot for taking just a little bit of time to show <laughs> us these little fossils. My pleasure. Did you know that the layers of rock in Indiana are kind of like a sandwich? This knife represents a glacier. All that's missing is Lake Michigan. Right about here. You know, I do love looking for fossils, but what I like even more is sharing what I find with kids just like you. I took the samples we collected to South Elementary in my hometown of Danville, Indiana. I stopped in on my friend, Jenny Woodward's fourth grade class. Using the sifting techniques we learned from William at the Children's Museum, we found some microfossils. We placed them in our homemade slides and studied them with a microscope. You, you, you dropped your rock? Oh, no, no, that's right. Right. How's that one? Is that one for me? I got to see that. We discussed the importance of studying fossils. Afterwards, it was time for a lesson from Miss Woodward. Miss Woodward is a fourth grade teacher at South Elementary. We have an aha science moment every single day in this room. I learn something new with every unit. This is her first year as a teacher. Today, she's teaching a lesson on natural resources and fossil fuels. And these students are going to do a little it's mining, like not for that. gold or coal. Instead, they're mining something delicious. In this exercise, the cookie represents the earth or the ground, and the chocolate chip is the resource. And as you can see, it's very difficult to remove the resource without destroying the ground. This gives us a little insight into how important and careful we must be when extracting the Earth's resources. He also talked about the importance of conserving as much energy as we can. You can't get it back. When we use it all up, it's gone. Another neat thing about science is you can learn things, you can make discoveries, and you also have some good cookies, too. <laughs> mm. Maybe that's the best part of science. I'm not sure. <laughs> You probably won't find chocolate chips out here. But there is another natural resource, coal. Coal is a fossil fuel found at differing depths in the Earth's crust. I'm in a pretty unique place here in Indiana. We're in the bottom of a coal mine, and I'm standing on coal. It's the result of prehistoric plants and animals being compressed over millions of years just like the sandwich earlier. Behind me, you can see the different layers of rock. And if you look carefully, you can actually see the topsoil, the subsoil, and then below it, this large gray area called shale, otherwise known as mudstone. Yep, tastes like mud. The gray shale is pretty interesting. There's actually fault lines, a natural process. But if you look carefully, you can see this black layer going right here. That's a coal layer that actually is valuable and it's thick enough to be mined. Mining coal is a cool business. So all this is actual money falling through my fingers right here. Because when you get to this part of the mining operation, this is where all the black gold is ready. Layers of coal ready to be scooped up, hauled up, processed, and sent on its way to power plants all across the Midwest and Indiana. It just so happens that this material is a combustible energy source. In fact, burning coal is one of the many ways we make electricity. The goal of the coal is to have a pile this big. This pile right here would heat a homes for a long time in Indiana. It takes a lot of effort to get this stuff out of the ground, and even more work to get the ground back to the way it was before the mine was here. It's called a strip mine because they strip the soils and they strip the shale and they save it to reclaim it. Now you see, behind me, it looks like a regular Indiana field. And they've worked really hard here to make that a reality.
This is George Bowles, and he is in charge of getting the land back in shape after the coal has been extracted. His team works to put the environment back together after it's been taken apart. It's quite a shuffle. Yeah. I'll let back. Back in South Dakota, it's a little easier. Here, you can find the coal right on top of the ground because nature does the strip mining for us through a process called erosion. Erosion occurs when a force like water moves sediment, which is mud, dirt, and sand, over the Earth's surface. As time goes by, erosion can do some amazing things. In Indiana, you can see the effects of erosion. And one of the best places to see it is inside a cave. A cave is a natural underground cavity, or a hole in the ground. There are many types of caves, lava tubes, sandstone, ice, and even sea caves, but roughly 95% of the world's caves are limestone, the same stuff that Indiana is made of. Hey, we're at Porter's Cave, a great example of sedimentary rocks and erosion. Let's go check it out, come on. Porter Cave is a limestone cave. The study of caves is called speology. Today, this group of kids and I are going spelunking, which just is a fancy way of saying caving. The first explorers of this cave used torches and candles to light the path. I truly enjoyed reliving the path blazed by the first explorers of this cave. You know, if you hold up the candle high, you can actually see some of the formations on here. And that's beautiful. Now, can you imagine what it's like to explore a cave just by candlelight? It's kind of fun, really, if you ask me. No, it's not. It's very creepy. It is a little creepy. Well, Are we almost out? No, we're going the other way. Why? Luckily, we now have flashlights. A cave like this is formed when rainwater absorbs CO2, carbon dioxide, from air and the soil. As it seeps down, it becomes a weak acid that dissolves limestone. The cave is formed by a chemical reaction, but also a physical reaction. Over hundreds of years, the flowing water erodes away the limestone and carries the sediments along the water's path, turning the water into a natural sanding machine. This passage was formed by water that carved through this solid rock. Hey, erosion happens above ground and underground. Now, it may seem like this process is only about removal, but as it turns out, there is also a process of building going on inside the caves. And this building produces some fantastic cave formations. Limestone is made of the mineral calcite. As the acid water dissolves the limestone, it picks up calcite and other minerals. Under the right conditions, the mineral-rich water will evaporate, leaving behind something new to the cave. Inside a cave, this process takes millions of years, but it's worth the wait. The result is a fantastic cave formation. The most common are stalactites that hang from the ceiling and stalagmites that grow up from the cave floor. Cave exploration is a great way to witness the power and beauty of nature, but it can be risky business. If you go caving, be careful and go with a grown-up. Remember to watch your step because a crack in the ceiling means a crack in the floor. And make sure you take nothing but pictures and leave nothing but footprints. For more information on caves and what you can do to preserve them, go to WFYI.org. Did you know Wind Cave in South Dakota is one of the longest caves in the world? It's only about five hours away from the Ruth Mason Quarry, the location of our dino dig. These fossils have been buried underground for millions of years. The soil above them and the rocks have protected them from the sun and wind and animals. As soon as they're exposed through erosion, it's a race to save them because they will disintegrate back into dirt and dust. The way we do this in the field is by putting a jacket around them made of plaster, aluminum foil, and wood for support. 
Carefully covering these fossils allows us to flip them over, finish the job, number them, and send them back to the lab for final preparation. After we get these fossils out of the ground and back home to Indiana, the real work will begin. The amount of time it takes is extraordinary. If you have a small bone and it only takes you three or four hours to dig, it'll take you a couple weeks to prep back in the lab. So Victor, we're finally back at the museum in the Paleo Prep Lab, and now the real work starts. So what do we have here in front of us? Uh, what we have here this morning is uh, we, we have a femur and a wonderful ischium. A femur and an ischium. Yes. And were these dug by museum staff? Actually, they were dug by two young gentlemen, two young boys. Ah, uh, okay. So at the Children's Museum, not only do teachers go on digs, but also kids and families yes. go on digs. Yep. This is one that we uh, worked on as soon as we got back. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the fibula that you might have seen uh, that uh, uh, the long limb bone. Mm -hmm. Someone has done some excellent work restoring this. So Victor, how many bones did you find? Uh, well this year we actually uh, found 118 bones. Wow. So this will fill our year uh, until we go back next year. Well I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you go ahead and get busy prepping these bones. Okay. Good luck. I can't wait to see how these things turn out. Thank you. Good job. Once the fossils come back to Indiana, we use the dental tools, epoxies, we consolidate them, we remove all the rock, uh, down to the bone, we'll use an air braider using uh, baking soda, we'll uh, b basically sandblast them uh, down to the chocolate brown. The bones that we're finding in Quarry B are very uh, good quality. You basically clean the rock off of them and they're done. There aren't any pieces missing on them. They're just the way you see them. You do what you can and that's what we do. Thanks to the men and women in the Paleo Prep Lab that have pieced together these prehistoric puzzles, we can enjoy full-size dinosaur skeletons. In earth science, whether it's big science or little science, it's all important science that helps us learn about the past. I'm Rick Croslin. Join me on the next Indiana Expedition. See you outside. Indiana Expeditions with Rick Crossland is made possible through the generous support of the Dr. Laura Hare Charitable Trust, enhancing Indiana's natural environment through preservation and protection of ecologically significant natural areas, and promoting environmental education, stewardship, and awareness. CEFI, the Science Education Foundation of Indiana, investing in Indiana's youth by encouraging them to become scientists and engineers, and to practice their careers in Indiana. Details at sefi.org. And the Center for School Improvement and Performance, Indiana Department of Education.